like to thank the Sydney Food Fairness Alliance for inviting me to speak here this evening. Food security is a really important issue for Western Sydney, but it's not one that actually gets a lot of airtime, and it's not one that a lot of people in this region actually consider as they go about their day-to-day -day business. So last year, Wesrock made a decision that we were actually going to make food security a front and centre issue and we formed Urban Adapt, the group of key stakeholders and local councils who were concerned about ensuring that Sydney, and in particular Western Sydney, has an ongoing food supply, one that's affordable, one that we can actually ensure that our residents have access to healthy food at a price that means that they're going to buy it. So the Wesrock councils, the 10 West Western Sydney councils, which stretch from Liverpool and Fairfield in the south, to Hawkesbury in the north, Blue Mountains in the west, Auburn and Bankstown in the east, they're at the forefront of managing many of the key issues that are associated with food security and ensuring our long-term supply and land usage. That we have to look at things like competing land demands, managing the peri-urban agriculture, Issues of obesity and poor health, a particular issue in Western Sydney. Poor education about nutrition and licensing and regulation of local food outlets, including markets. So the remaining rural and semi-rural land on the outskirts of Sydney, it's being fought over for many numerous uses and we are running out of land. Housing, a key issue and noble goal to supply affordable housing for an area that's expected to absorb an extra million people in the next 20 years. Yet, you can't eat your house. So there's not a lot of point providing affordable housing if you can't provide affordable food to go along with that. We need to encourage jobs. Western Sydney, Phil did a fabulous report for Wesrock a couple of years ago, demonstrating that we're going to be 200,000 jobs short by 2031 in Western Sydney. We need land to bring jobs. We need to bring industry to our region. So these competing priorities, transport, something, public transport, something that's been lacking in Western Sydney. We need the land for the rail corridors, particularly in the northwest and the southwest. We need to ensure we have recreation space, encourage healthy living. But importantly, we do need to ensure that our agricultural land is protected. And managing these key demands is a challenge for our councils, who are also played off by other levels of government, who have their own agendas and who have legislative requirements that we're required to meet, planning policies. The new government's announced that they're doing a 50-50 split on new developments. 50% development on greenfield site, 50% infield. The previous government had a 70-30 policy. Wesrock supports the 70-30. We think that infield development's more appropriate and more achievable. We don't think you can achieve 50% of new housing on greenfield sites, particularly in Western Sydney. You have environmental issues that you need to consider. Building house near, housing near key waterways will have an impact on our environment. That one of the things that Wesrock's really keen to do is to stem the, last, la, stem the loss of agricultural land by stealth. Minor rezonings here, ring fencing here, and before you know it, our agricultural land has been eaten by housing or other forms of development. One of my first media calls when I became Wesrock president was from one of the Hillshire newspapers wanting to know my opinion on the chicken farm. The chicken farm was an issue because all of the neighbours were whinging that the smell from the farm was impacting on them. So the first question I asked was, how long had the chicken farm been there? Well, that had been there since the 1900s. How long had the houses been there? Well, they'd all been built in the last 20 years. So my view was, you knew what you were getting into, and poultry and eggs is a key industry for Western Sydney and we need to preserve that. So I came down on the side of the farmers. I don't think that's what the local newspaper had wanted to hear, but that is strongly what I think you should do. They were there first, and the provision of food is really important. One of the things that we also do is that we want to promote agriculture in every local government area by recognising fresh food production in our local environment plans whether it's the large-scale farming in areas like Blacktown or here in Penrith, the Hawkesbury and Liverpool, to the small community gardens that we see in other areas such as Fairfield and Auburn. The large-scale protection of agricultural land must be done at a state level. 
that we can do our bits as councils and local government, but overall that protection must rest with the state government. And we would like to see a state environment planning policy, a new SEP that actually recognises the importance of those agricultural lands. Of course, other issues are all intertwined with this, health issues. 55% of the population in Western Sydney is overweight or obese. Of the 10 local government areas, only the Blue Mountains falls below average when it comes to obesity levels. Of the other nine local government areas are all above the national average, and that is shameful. Only 8.3% of Western Sydney residents consume the recommended amount of vegetables every day. 10% of our community has diabetes. And poor nutrition can be blamed on a lot of these new lifestyle illnesses. Exacerbated by shift work, low income, a lack of education, and limited access to fresh food, which all impact on the decisions that consumers make. Now, one of the things that I do not want to see happen in Western Sydney is what is happening in parts of remote Australia. If you're unfortunate enough to live on the Torres Strait at the moment, you're paying $9 for a head of lettuce. Compared to what you can get in the supermarket, the unhealthy options, that's what people are doing. And that's why those parts of the country are experiencing epidemics in obesity, because it is cheaper to buy something that is not good for you. And promotions such as what we've seen recently with the $1 cheeseburger between 12 and 2 is not helpful. When the cheapest option for lunch is a cheeseburger, we're doing something very, very wrong. Food affordability is critical and it's a key part of food security. Food miles. One of the reasons that lettuce is so expensive on the Torres Strait is it has to be shipped a long way to get there. We don't want to see that in Western Sydney. Recently I had someone tell me that, well, we get everything else from China, why shouldn't we get our food from China? But the concern that we would be bringing so-called fresh food overseas is laughable. And the costs associated with transporting that food is just excessive. So we need to make sure that we do address the issue of affordability by providing food that is close to home, which reduces the transport miles. Fresh food, when it is more expensive, is the first casualty in a tightened family budget. And convenience is a major issue for working families, particularly those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, who will often grab the easy takeaway meal rather than cook a meal at home made from fresh produce. So we believe that more needs to be done to put downward pressure on the right types of food. One of the other issues in Western Sydney that's been identified by the Centre for Health Innovation and Partnership is that in an area which is culturally diverse with a large population that don't read or write English very well is that the information is not reaching communities. We need to make sure that the nutritional education has the emphasis in the non-English speaking backgrounds and that that material is available. One of the other things that is a bit of a concern, and was a large concern in Western Sydney, is the dominance of the two big chains, which has ensured that the prices for our local farmers are not always competitive. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that our market gardeners have the opportunity to sell their produce, to sell it in bulk through things like local farmers markets, where it will become more affordable and they'll be able to be more competitive. Agriculture is a key driver in the Western Sydney economy. That a large percentage of employment in market gardening is employed in urban local government areas and employs locals. People don't like to travel far to go to work, so if they can get a job close to home, they take it. And 57% of employment in food processing is located in cities. Western Sydney, which desperately needs to revive its flagging manufacturing sector, would be the ideal place to increase that food processing. Have it close to here, then the farmers don't have far to ship their produce and we can actually have new jobs closer to home that promote that fresh food. We're home to 1.9 million people in Greater Western Sydney, expecting another million. It does need to be managed. 
we do need to ensure that all planning policies take into account not just where we're going to house people, where we're going to employ people and how they're going to get to and from work, it needs to take into account how we're going to feed them. And currently, that level of planning isn't done. It's easy to look at the big ticket items, but when it comes to things like food security, it drops to the bottom of the list. One of the things that we also think needs to be looked at is in the context of a carbon price. That that is a critical reason why we need to reduce the food miles. Because the costs, which in my view are completely justified in carbon pricing, will be put on the top of food if they do have to travel long distances. That's another reason why it makes sense to have processing in Western Sydney, it makes sense to have farming in Western Sydney, and it makes sense to ensure that our local population, which will soon be three million people, has a continued access to fresh food that is affordable and is local. Thank you. So we might just leave that sitting there for a minute, yep, and then we can just scroll through. Um, because I, I think... Uh, well, actually, I might, I might run through it now so that it doesn't actually distract us because I think one of the reasons that um, I'm doing what I'm doing and um, let me tell you, as a little girl, um, one of the last things you ever dream of being is president of New South Wales Farmers, you know? <laughs> just doesn't, um, doesn't enter into the equation, you know? Princesses, queens, you know, uh, maybe nurses, doctors, lawyers, but uh, here I am as president of New South Wales Farmers. And um, it's a great role, but it's one I never dreamed of doing. And um, the reason I'm doing it is because I'm very passionate about uh, agriculture. I'm very passionate about food producers. Uh, my husband is a, a fourth generation farmer in, on the same farm. And I have an 18-year-old son who's got two exams to go before he's finished his schooling. And uh, he also, his first round of schooling, I haven't let him in on that secret yet, he has to go around again yet. Um, but, uh, and he's very passionate to be about being the fifth, the fifth generation farmer on our farm. And I was talking to somebody earlier about uh, advocacy, which hopefully some of you have heard about. It's the new sexy word about being positive about agriculture. And um, I'm, a, I'm a great advocate. And I think that we farmers need to be great advocates if we want to stay in the game, really. So, so what we're seeing on the screen now is, is one of the reasons that I have to say that I did become involved initially uh, in New South Wales Farmers. We, my husband has been a member for a very long time. His family have been members for a very long time. Uh, they've always believed in the power of a single voice and, and the need for a strong voice. Um, but the reason we became active uh, was all to do with what's on the screen now. And I'm sure some of you have already seen these slides, but they're worth whipping through again because I do have a special focus on Western Sydney. So across the state at the moment, we have a large amount of the state, more than 50%, currently under mineral and petroleum title of one sort or another. They're the current mineral titles that we have. And there, the current mineral titles added on the mineral title applications. Then we have the current coal titles plus the coal title applications. Then we have the current petroleum titles the, and the current petroleum title applications and the rivers. And if you could imagine the rivers as, and I think Costa might even say something like the lifeblood of the land or something like that, if I'm reading you right, um, then uh, in actual fact, you can just have a look at that and see how much of our wonderful food producing land is actually currently under threat of mining or coal seam gas and the impacts that that industry poses. Um, now, what I did want to just show you, and I'm sure, again, some of you have probably seen this map, but I think you need to see it, are the current petroleum titles just here in Western Sydney. And um, if you can't see it very well on screen, uh, you can go into the department's website. They have a website called MinView, and you can access it there and you can have a good look at exactly what titles are overlying your land or your farms or your houses uh, and, and your suburbs here in Sydney. And I think that you would be absolutely astonished and amazed and appalled uh, if you did. So I think I just wanted to get that, just wanted to get that really out of the, out of the way first. Um, as Costa said, I was elected this year as, as the president of New South Wales Farmers. And our main role is really to lobby 
politicians of all persuasions to ensure that their decisions don't unfairly impact on our food and fibre producers. Because we don't actually just grow food, we grow fibre as well. Another role we have which is increasingly important is to bridge the gap between the people who actually grow the food, who's us, and the people who actually eat the food, who are often the people on the eastern, predominantly the people over on the eastern seaboard and in the cities. And um, we think that there is a huge disconnect now between the food that people actually get and eat and, uh, and, and us people who actually grow it, and, and, and not, a, not a good understanding at all of how that food actually comes to be on their table or in their supermarkets. And, uh, you know, there is a big misunderstanding about, you know, where does milk come from? Does milk actually come out of a carton or a, or, or a plastic bottle these days? What do cows do? And, and wheat, you know, what, does, what is wheat, you know? Is it bread? No, can't see how. As an industry, we're really keenly aware of our own responsibilities to meet the growing demand for food. Everybody has heard about the percentage increases and we know that we actually have to double our food production by 2050. Look, we're ready for it. As a sector, we've done it before and we continue to innovate and find new ways to produce more food with the same amount of land and water. But the reality facing our sector now is not producing more with the same, it's actually producing more with less. Less land and less water. And I'm going to focus on the first of these here because while land use conflict is not a new concept to many farmers across New South Wales, in many ways, and you might be amazed to know uh, because you hear about the Liverpool Plains, you hear about the Hunter Valley, but in, in actually in many ways, the Sydney Basin really is the front line for the current conflict. Agriculture on the Sydney fringe plays an incredibly important role in providing the city with fresh fruit and veggies. The value of production in the Sydney Basin is in excess of $1 billion, or in food terms, 80% of Sydney's mushrooms, 90% of Sydney's fresh vegetables, almost all the Asian vegetables sold at the Sydney markets, and over 50% of Sydney's tomatoes. Despite this enormous production, this wonderful production of fresh produce, we are already seeing imports of fruit and vegetables rising sharply. At the moment, we are importing 34% of the fruit we consume and 19% of the vegetables. That's a startling figure. Figures like this highlight how important agricultural production on Sydney's fringe really is. Alison talked about food miles. How important is it to have this food grown right here on your doorstep? Despite this, though, under the former Keneally government's metropolitan strategy, we were set to see 53% of Sydney's fruit and vegetable producers displaced by development corridors to the northwest and southwest of Sydney by 2036. At the same time, every fruit and vegetable grower currently falls under one of the expiration licences for coal seam gas, as you would have seen on the map, which blankets Sydney's west. These are two of the many issues which New South Wales Farmers is currently advocating strongly on. The encroachment of housing further into agricultural lands, not only in Sydney but also in other key food producing areas of the state, is a significant issue. I've outlined the projected footprint of that impact here in Sydney, but we find the real effects go well beyond that. As agricultural areas become urbanised, it becomes increasingly difficult for farmers to operate as neighbours complain about fertiliser use, noise from, noise from machinery, or perhaps the smell of chickens. The landholders who were there first finally become the subject of enough complaints that they have no choice but to change their land use too. This means that as established buffer distances move northwest and southeast to keep pace with Sydney's expansion, the footprint moves further each time the council has formally approved. I can't tell you how heartened I was to hear Alison's story about the chicken farm. And I'm going to take that back and share it with my council because um, that, that unfortunately so often we hear the other stories about the farmers who have been forced out because people who've come into their neighbourhoods. Relocation for these people is an option but not a very good one. The quality of the produce, the cost of transport and the carbon footbridge of footprint of production all change dramatically when the point of production is moved further from the point of consumption. We're talking food miles again here. What is needed is strong government policy which recognises that for urban development to increase, so must food production. We're having a million more people out here in the West, how are we going to food th feed them? 
we have to allow peri-urban farmers to continue operating. We need to find a way for them to do so. Another area in which we have been very vocal is the uh, debate around mining and coal seam gas on prime agricultural land. Much of this has come out of proposals to develop open cut mines on the Liverpool Plains, some of the most productive farming country in the world and the land that I call home. Currently, well over half the state is covered by titles for coal, mineral, coal seam gas pr exploration or production, as you've seen on the maps. Many people's homes are covered without their knowledge. The Sydney Basin is no different, where we have a handful of companies holding a patchwork of licences which cover every inch of the metropolitan area. At Penrith here, where we stand tonight, we're covered by PEL2, which is held by AGL. As you head towards the city, at about Blacktown, you start entering into Macquarie Energy Territory. What does this mean for food production? That's a question that is yet to be answered in any detail at all by these companies. The process for extracting coal seam gas often involves a process known as hydraulic fracturing or fracking. That means pumping a mixture of chemicals, water and sand into the coal seam at high pressure to fracture the rocks and the coal seams. They then drain the water from that seam to release the gas. The question I and many farmers have is what effect does that have on the aquifers above that our businesses and our communities and our houses and our people rely on? Most companies acknowledge that there will be some effects, but they very much vary on the specifics of what that will be, how long it will take and what will, the, what will happen at the end. As a farmer who relies on that water, those specifics, that science that accompanies and that should accompany that industry are terribly important. But under the current regulatory system, the state regulatory system, I have no right to know what that outcome will be. I simply have a small window to agree with the company about the terms of their access, and failing that, I can be taken to arbitration and fined for obstructing entry. The water, however, is not our only concern. Once a project proceeds to production, a network of pipes and roads are required to transport vehicles, gas and wastewater. Thousands and thousands of tonnes of salt are produced and must be disposed of, and issues about biosecurity arise with increased traffic moving from farm to farm. Before coming to power at the last New South Wales election, the O'Farrell government committed to the Strategic Regional Land Use Policy, which seeks to protect landholders, their water, and strategic agricultural lands right across New South Wales. New South Wales farmers, and myself personally, was heavily involved in the development of that policy and is committed to ensuring the reforms it outlines are implemented before any further development can proceed that will have such huge impacts on our lands. To date, the implementation process has been a very difficult one, with fairly limited progress being made since the last election. It is becoming unclear whether upfront exclusion zones will be established, which would mean continued uncertainty for farmers and miners about where agriculture or extractive industry can develop. It also remains to be seen whether the approvals process for interference with aquifers will be strong enough to require CSG companies to actually prove that their practices are safe before being allowed to proceed. This is certainly an issue for the Sydney Basin as new developments are assessed in Camden and St Peters and an issue for every consumer who wants access to clean and plentiful water and food grown here in New South Wales. A key issue for New South Wales farmers is also, way, also the way that landholders are being treated by these companies. Whether you're in the towns or out in the bush, it seems to make no difference. The position that landholders are placed in by the legal framework means that there is no obligation on companies to recognise the existing business, the existing enterprise, the existing food production enterprise or agricultural business that they are interfering with. The simplest solution of this is to give landholders the right to refuse access to companies wanting to access their land. They do it in WA, um, they don't do it here. This is not about denying access to publicly owned resources, it is simply about levelling the playing field for farmers who are being asked to negotiate with multinational corporations with the threat of arbitration or court action hanging over their head. These are just a snapshot of two of the issues facing agriculture in the Sydney Basin and indeed right now in New South Wales. It's great to see events like this bringing these problems to light in metropolitan Sydney because these aren't just problems for farmers, these are problems for food producers and food eaters. Thank you very much. 
Well, thanks very much for the invitation to speak this evening. Um, maybe Ian will say more about this, but the headline statement really is only about 1,000 active commercial farms remain in the Sydney Basin. Now, I think I have to disagree a little bit with, with Fiona just now because our work says that their output is relatively insignificant, except, as Fiona said, in a few categories like mushrooms, poultry, turf, pasture lands for recreational horses and cut flowers. But I don't think there's much else. And in fact, our calculations show that the supermarket value of that slimy set of fruit and vegetables that are in the refrigerator crisper that we throw out each week probably exceeds the total weekly output value, which is about 20 million bucks or a, or a billion per year. That output waste exceeds what the whole basin grows. But, and this is my point, food in Sydney is big business. Sydney has 30,000 workers in food manufacturing, 60,000 workers in food retailing, and 100,000 workers in cafes, restaurants, and fast food outlets. Food in Sydney is rich, it's corporate, it's industrial, it's advertising and consumption driven, and it's a complex supply chain. And that supply chain isn't local, it's long, it's heavily interstate, it's probably unsustainable in many ways, and in my opinion, it's fairly ordinary in terms of food quality. Now, Sydney has 4.5 million people. They have more square hectareage, meterage, I should say, although some of them measure their houses in hectares, <laughs> more square meterage of housing than anywhere else in the world. Sydney will house 6 million people within the next 25 years, and according to Premier Barry O'Farrell, 50% of this additional population will live in new houses in Greenfields areas. The targeted urban development sites will eliminate over 50% of those 1,000 farms. But urban growth has always eliminated farming in the Sydney Basin. So what's the big deal? Let's resort to the personal. <laughs> when my family moved to Panania in Sydney's southwest in 1957, the new railway line through the area was lined with market gardens. An abandoned jam factory at Picnic Point still had stewed stone fruit in its giant cauldrons. One Sunday, I remember driving in our vanguard to Camden and I saw the magic of cows being milked on a merry-go-round. And then we picnicked like a good Catholic family in the grounds of a novitiate, or perhaps it was a monastery. And the word rotolacta has stuck in my mind ever since. And it's now hard to believe that the eternal presence of dairying and Catholicism in Sydney's southwest have disappeared, just like the Anthony Horden's oak tree. Occasionally, Dad cranked up the vanguard to just drive a few kilometres on a sun Saturday morning to get chickens from the grower at Mulpera for special Sunday lunches. I remember their freshly snapped necks poked out of the rolled newspaper on the back seat on the way home, and their bodies were still warm. We took them to the laundry out the back, and we cleaned and plucked, and we carted buckets of steaming water from the house and we learned that smelling and handling the guts of animals needed new words in our lives, like visceral. And we learned that while eating flesh could be a wonderful thing, especially around a joyful table, it required signing on to an acceptance of an earthbound coupling of grain, animal life and human toil. I remember too that the Sunday table carried tall bottles of Resch's dinner ale and they would turn our best glassware frosty and that my first sip of DA's foamy bitterness became my fondest childhood taste. And I could see and trace my dad's loyalty to Dr Resch, as he called it, right down to those funny anti-competitive practices 
that, man, that made Pannonia pub a tied Resher's pub. But that meant I knew its beer came from the Waverley Brewery on South Dowling Street. And I knew what its heavy, hoppy, grainy, malty odours were as we walked through them on the way to the Sydney Cricket Ground. By the 1960s, the farmlands in our nook of the Georges River were gone. But when I rode through Marsfield and North Ryde on my motorbike on my way to Macquarie University in the 1970s, I could arrive home with a parcel under my jacket for mum containing salad veggies or tomatoes or cut flowers. New houses in Panania and then North Ryde didn't mean the end of market gardening the small farms just pushed westward and they occupied the new fringe, just like market gardening or truck farming does on the edges of cities all over the world. And as the farms moved, the farmers changed. In Panania and North Ryde, they were Italians. Macquarie University itself was built on 109 farms, 59 of which belonged to Italian families but further west the Maltese were taking over. And when I took my first job as a geography teacher at Riverston in the late 1970s, in the shadow of a meatworks and downwind from the tannery at Kellyville, we stopped on Friday mornings to buy still warm, freshly plucked chickens, this time from small Maltese growers at Schofields, every Friday morning for the staff chicken raffle at morning tea and we loaded up the boot with corn and tomatoes and cucumbers and fresh eggs for the weekend. And so it continued in the 80s and 90s, new migrants, the, the Vietnamese and the Chinese, and still new subdivisions, which, which meant new urban frontiers and new roads and cheap urban water, which generated new farming businesses, which provided modest cash returns only to the farmer, but the promise of capital gains to come the perfect pathway to prosperity for the first generation migrant. Now, 2011, and 11, we face a last frontier because now our urban fringe abuts floodplains, national parks, sandstone escarpments. Cheap water rights are gone. Cheap five and 10 acre parcels are gone. And our new migrants had business degrees and they work in finance or they have medical degrees and they drive taxis <laughs> and they have no interest in a strained back or a sunburned neck. So now we have this controversy, the pending loss of a thousand farms and the raised concern of the inner elites in Sydney as if we've discovered a flock of endangered parrots on a rocky patch of grassland about to be bulldozed for an open cut mine. And we cry out for governments to protect this last of a species we hold crucifixes to the faces of the developers and we scorn the McMansion dwellers. And we gather every first Saturday of the month in an inner city car park, masquerading as a farmer's market. And we pop half a dozen Kifla potatoes dripping with organically certified earth into a Hessian shopping bag. And we toddle off to spend about the same amount of money on the Saturday Sydney Morning Herald and then twice as much again on single origin coffees on our way home to rest. And then we decide to forego the Kiflers and spend 50 times more at the next fab local eatery and its fusion hydro colloidal molecularised gastronomic menu with its Dino Giovanna chairs. And we feel good that we have done our bit to save the basin and the planet and all that we stand for. As I think seriously about how to save our thousand endangered parrots, I realise how tenuous Sydney Ciders food relationships have always been. 200 years ago in 1811, the heavens opened in our basin just a few weeks ago and a long prevailing se severe drought was ended. A fresh surge down the Nepean River and a colony of fresh food, a colony that needed fresh food was saved and the local Darug people looked bemused at all the fuss. A hundred years ago, in our first ever census, I saw today there were over 6,000 farmers on Sydney's fringe for an entire basin population of just 630,000 people. Perhaps that was the golden age. But in general, our whitey Anglo traditions, call it culture if you dare, have lacked visceral engagement 
with a food supply chain as daily Sydney life, such that by 2011, our cleansed shiny steel glass and linoleum air-conditioned packaged hygienic supermarket has become our barrier to the world of food. But it needn't be so. Last year I lived for seven months in two old university towns, Oxford in the south of England and Bologna in northern Italy. One place Bologna has never abandoned its viscerality, if there is such a word. The windows of our old top floor apartment looked at the bells of San Stefano Cathedral through the exhaust chimneys of the Gamberini Bakery. Our local Sfoglina worked by her street front, front window, her uncovered hands tying pasta squares with a paste of minced meat and offal and into tortellini. Our trattoria called La Brasilia turned wild boar into pig's trotter sausage and we washed it down with Sangiovese di Romagna. And soon we understood that despite that giant food <coughs> company Parmalat, which offers industrial foods in, Ital in Italy's equally sanitised Pam supermarketti, that local food supply chains had indeed survived the 20th century and that outstanding local food was sold to queues of buyers, rich and poor, young and old, who every day, except for feast days, attend Bologna's covered markets and that it will ever be, ever be thus. The other place, Oxford, is now rediscovering its local food supply chains. Its medieval covered market is sparking back to life. Fresh shot quail and grouse hang outside butcher shops. Local raspberries and apples taste divine. Local cheeses from, heaven forbid, unpasteurised local milk tell us what we could have back in Australia. But out in the countryside, things get very exciting. Drive along the A417 from Wantage to Wallingford, past the countryside cottages of Conservative MPs and News Limited editors and gastro pubs with French chefs. And you can stop and buy local fruits and vegetables and lamb and beef and poultry and cheeses and local beer and cider and fresh baked pies. And you don't need, need for much else in life, really, except for French wine, of course. The rub, though, is that you pay hefty prices to eat from the A417 food trail. But this isn't a problem for the very well-heeled burgers of Oxfordshire. If you're wealthy, then you can afford to boycott Tesco. And so a conclusion. Sure, there are good arguments to save Sydney's 1,000 threatened parrots. But even if protected, 1,000 won't create an enduring food supply chain like in Bologna. Sure, politicians must control developers. Regulators must rein in monopoly supermarket chains. Fledgling organic ethical food producers must be nurtured. But the powerful force for good is the consumer. We live in one of the world's wealthiest and well-educated cities. There is no greater impediment to the implementation of our food values than our consumption behaviours. We spend a load on food. The force for real change is in our wallets. It's up to us. I too am going to start with a quote. As, uh, as Phil was talking, I, just, I remembered it. Um, I just want to read out a quote to you. Um, Sydney is a small area and not particularly rich from the growing point of view, yet it produced three quarters of the state's lettuces, half the spinach, a third of the cabbages and, three, and a quarter of the beans. Seventy per cent of the state's poultry farms were in the county and more than 18 per cent of Sydney's milk came from the county. The preservation of farms and market gardens is therefore of considerable importance for the well-being of Sydney as well as for the economy of the state. Rural production in, the, in Sydney has always played an important part in supplying food for Sydney and the advantage is a proximity to the largest market in Australia with more than, more than compensating for the somewhat poor soil conditions. Can anyone tell me who said that and when? Was it, it was a guy called Professor Dennis Winston. He was the Professor of Architecture and Planning at Sydney University and this was written in 1957. And I've actually, he actually put the county in there, not Sydney. Um, 
I love ag what was it? Agri advocacy. Ad agri advocacy. My name's Ian Sinclair. I'm an agrivocate. <laughs> or an advocate. Agrivocate. Yeah, that's too hard to say. <laughs> Don't let me have anything to drink. I'll slur it all over the place. Okay, just let me find the presentation. Um, for those of you that know me and have seen me present, I've only got 22 slides this evening, so I'm going to whip through them because I do, we, do want to, we do want to hear you talk and hear you ask us questions and, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, Australia, sorry, I'll get a pr proper map of Australia. There's a better map of Australia. There's our food growing areas in Australia and as you can see, the actual food growing areas, the good food land is actually the soils basically are on the edge here. Um, um, Professor Henry Nix did a study of Australia's soils in the 1970s and he reckoned it was 10% arable land mass. If you go to the FAO's website, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organisation, they've actually done an analysis of all the world's uh, arable land. Worldwide, the arable land is 10%. Australia is now quoted as 5.7% of the arable land is, 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 a, is, a, is, uh, is arable land mass. Now there's our population density. I'm going to go backwards. Where's the page up? There we go. Yeah, it's not working. There we go, that one? That one. See the difference? Similarities? Differences? Similarities? Where's our food grown? The inland areas, Murray-Darling Basin, South Australia and Western Australia. This is where the grain, the fibre, the vegetables, uh, vineyards, orchards, etc., sheep and cattle and pigs and poultry come from. Metropolitan Fringe, I think uh, Phil and I need to, uh, need to check our figures and, uh, and have a bit of a chat about it, is a significant producer of perishable vegetables, vineyards, poultry, specialised niche agriculture. Everyone's been telling us for the past 10 years, especially as the, uh, as the city dwellers have finally realised that there was a drought happening. I too have, a, we, ha we grew up, when I was growing up, my family had a farm at Willow Tree on the Liverpool Plains. I know what the Liverpool Plains is like. I also know about the third tap in the kitchen. The third tap in the kitchen was the bore water tap. You never, if you put the bore, if you put the rainwater tap into the uh, to the washing up, your your life wasn't worth living. Um, droughts occur all the time, but suddenly people in Sydney are starting to realise that droughts occur. Um, everyone was telling us that the the, the, uh, the Murray Darling Basin was the uh, the food bowl of Australia. It's not the food bowl; it's a food bowl. This is some analysis that I've done. I've gone through the ABS agricultural statistics for all of the production of perishable vegetables, broken it down into kilograms and aggregated it. And that's the figures there. 63% of the perishable vegetables grown in New South Wales come from the metropolitan area, the Sydney Statistical Division. Adding them all together, it's 68% of Australia's perishable vegetables come from the metropolitan fringe and coastal areas of Queensland. There's a map showing what it is. So there's the, uh, the perishable vegetables. Now I want you to have a look at, I'm doing some work up in the Whitsundays at the moment and I can tell you what, it's wonderful going up to the Whitsundays region in winter because you start to get into shorts as you get up there. Um, and that's got Bowen and Proserpine in it, which are very significant agricultural areas, and they're up in the top there. But if we then have a look at the, the population growth, you can see that we've created, we have what I call a contested landscape there. The population project, everything above, every, everything above green, green, yellow, um, orange and red, is much higher than the Australian average population growth, which is 1.3%. So you can see the the... The, the Bowen area, the um, sorry, the Mackay area, in, up in the, this area here. Have a look at that. Then we go here. It's one of the highest growing, highest. There's one tomato producer up there that sends 800,000 10 kilo boxes of tomatoes out of his packing shed every year, and that's one of. And he's one of the smaller ones. So. Agriculture on the fringe, as we've been saying, it's a billion dollar a year industry. Now the spooky thing about it is have a look at New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. 13% of the value of each of those areas and a very minuscule amount of the land. New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria also are 78.7% of the population and are growing at a 1.6% per annum. Remember the previous slide, 1.3% is the Australian average. Here's, the, uh, here's the, 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 the graph showing the statistics. Have a look at the Sydney region on the left and the Murray and Murray and Murray and Murray on the right. That's what we expect to see for vegetables. 
When we break it down into the perishables, though, we see the dominance of the Sydney Basin. Now let's have a look at Sydney region. This is the numbers, the actual numbers there. I'm sure the, the presentation will be made available, so you don't need to look at that. But what I want you to have a look at is the land use. Oh, do you want to go back? Okay. All right. Can I have another minute while they look at that, please, Costa? <laughs> okay, we're going forward, sorry. I've done a land use survey. I've actually driven around every block of land in, in Western Sydney and driven past every house. Well, I won't say every. I'll, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll use the conservative academic thing and say probably 90% of the houses I've driven past. And I've actually plotted them on a map and added them all up. 78.3% of the land use is rural residential. But it produces a billion dollars a year of agriculture with a multiplier conservatively of four to five maybe, maybe six. So that's, let's, let's be conservative again. Four billion dollars it puts into the New South Sydney economy, but it's coming from a very small land base. Rural land use conflict occurs. Um, people that live on a rural residential block, and I'm not that there's anything wrong with it, um, but the people that live on a rural residential block, they have a new type of recreation. It's called recreational lawn mowing. Has any, put up your hand if you've ever mown a lawn at night on one of the rider ponds, actually lawn tractors at night. Anyone ever done it? Why do they have headlights? It's a, it's a bloke thing. The person that lives here is a recreational lawnmower. They complained about the farmer next door. They, they were saying, they were quoted in the newspaper, this is in Wallandilly where I used to work. They, used, they were saying that the, uh, the, the lady was saying that she feared for the health of her unborn child because of the, uh, the, the spray drift that was going to, because we have a, a tank water system, don't you know? We don't like you people in the city that have the, the, the reticulated water. Um, we actually pulled the BA for the house and found that it actually had a first flush system, so she didn't really understand what she was talking about. See the poultry farm? Now, McDonald's don't have to go far for the egg and bacon McNuckins or the chicken McNuggets. <laughs> and that's what it looks like. There is a term in planning called existing use rights. He has existing use rights. He can stay for as long as... He's even now got a farm gate sale from his place. Um, having worked in Wallandilly, I can tell you that uh, there is, Wallandilly has the most turkeys of any local government area in the country. <laughs> and because I spent eight and a half years as the strategic planning manager there, I can tell you that some of those turkeys are the feathered variety. The guy that lives here used to live here. He sold that, built this, then started complaining about the poultry farm. This is the farmer's revenge. Now, as you can see, he needs to put spell check over his paintbrush. <laughs> um, and as you can tell, if you're a keen uh, person with the red pen, he can't spell neighbours. This was taken in the United States. Um, the sign down here actually says, commie planning zoners, nice people welcome, sorry, commie planning zoners don't. Not. It's the other side of it. When you are faced with rural land use conflict as a farmer, you just want to say, you know, the bird, show the person the bird. And I'm not talking about the fluttering things, and that, that sort of bird. Um, so, the community is also very concerned with what we're dealing with. We have the cave people, the citizens against virtually everything. Then we have a dude, a developer under delusionary expectations. And when the cave people meet the dudes, you get a Lulu, a locally unwanted land use. And the political response is Nimtu, not in my term of office. <laughs> this is what we deal with. So, if we want to think of food, it's a necessity of life, as Costa said. It needs, f it needs land, water and food to, land and water to grow, and that brings us to locational factors. If we want to think about the locational factors of food, we have land, water, climate, soils and nutrients, economic development, infrastructure, labour force and markets. It needs certainty, it needs minimal risks, and, it needs, and that leads us to food, risk, food production risk factors. The food production risk factors are natural hazards, floods, cyclones and drought. We then have the climate change, variability, sea rise, sea level rise and ocean acidification. Then we have competition and rural land use conflict, which is urbanisation, rural residential, environmental protection and coal and gas. They're the issues that we need to think about when we're talking about planning for food. So, food is important. It is a necessity of life. Traditionally, it's been grown on the edge of our, uh, our cities and towns. What we need to do is we need to provide for more food for the growing population, but the good land is being paved over. Planning for food security is not being given a high agenda on the, planning, on, on, sorry, on the agenda of planning or governments. 
priority has been given to water, housing, environmental awareness and social issues. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but um, my dad was a veterinary, uh, an academic in veterinary parasitology and he used to say, never knock a farmer with your mouth full or a woolen jumper on. We haven't been given, we've been mostly ignored it. We've started to address it. The Metro plan and the previous Metro strategy have addressed it, but we haven't seen the right number, amount of resources put to the people in the agencies to try and to give them the resources to do it. So planning is not about predicting the future, it's about being prepared for it. The way we get prepared for it is understand what's happening. So we need policy and regulation. We need economic development incentives and infrastructure. We need community engagement, communication and education. But more importantly, we need to develop um, sort of policies and projects which link all those together. So what we do, we do, currency, we do policy and regulation really well. Everyone thinks, oh, we'll just zone it. That's easy. That's what the government department's planning says. We'll just zone it. That'll fix it. It won't fix it because we need to give economic development incentives and infrastructure. We need to engage with the community. We need to get good and meaningful data. So planning is needed for food security. We've got to have a multifaceted approach. We need good and meaningful data. Political and dollar commitments, statutory incentives and education all need to be considered. We need to involve the players in the discussions now and investigations, and we need a food strategy for Sydney. Really, or a food land strategy, I think, is what is needed, because a food strategy for, for Australia is too big to cover under one document. I think we need to break it down into the component parts. Um, we need to make some decisions now and not leave it till it's too late. I reckon we can grow food and grow houses and achieve a sustainable food, future food security. Otherwise, it might end up like this. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on um, and pay respects to the elders past and present. Just very briefly, for those of you who don't know the Sydney Food Fairness Alliance, I'll just give you a brief background on how we started. We began in 2005. Um, and as an alliance, we brought together people who have come from very diverse groups, um, but all joined by common interest in food and concerned about a number of issues that threaten the future of our food systems and supplies. In the Sydney Alliance, we've got uh, farmers, environmentalists, human rights and advocacy groups, some large charitable organisations, academics and planners, students, citizens. We cover a very broad range of groups and I think that's one of the strengths is that we're not focused on one particular um, interest group. We've got people coming together trying to look at making bridges between some of those different areas. We've been holding regular public events um, such as this where people can meet and discuss some of the pressing issues we face. Um, but we've also been actively involved in lobbying at a, a local and state and national level to advocating for development of food policy, um, taking a holistic approach to um, looking at our food supplies and food systems for the future. Um, for such a long time, food has been hived off into its own area. So we have departments of housing and um, employment and education. We don't have a department of food. We don't have um, what we would argue for is a cross-government approach looking at food as it affects health, as it affects the environment, um, as it's impacted on by water, as it affects um, uh, transport, um, agriculture. So there's, there's so many different issues that we think need to be um, taken on in looking at how, how and where our food will come from in the future. Since 2005, we've seen an explosion of interest in these issues, and more and more people are now questioning the basis of the current food system um, and calling for more thoughtfulness and better planning about it. We've got a great panel lined up. We hope for a, a great discussion tonight. Um, finally, I'd just like to say that we wouldn't have been possible to hel hold this evening without very generous support from sponsors. Uh, firstly, Penrith City Council provided the venue and uh, promoted the event locally in Western Sydney. DebtPAC and Premier NorthPAC have given us the environmentally friendly little boxes that you've loaded up your food into. Trade Winds have provided tea and coffee, and Rosnay Organic Wines provided discounted wine. Food Connect have provided discounted fresh vegetables. Um, all, the, all of those vegetables came from a 60 kilometre radius of Sydney. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank the caterers, Fairfield High School, who um, is a, a new social enterprise group that's doing catering that's um, formed from parents in a high school that has a very high refugee and migrant intake and they've just started a catering business for the first time. So I'll hand over to Costa now to um, moderate what I hope will be a very exciting evening for us all.
Ed Beale is not my name. I'm a galah. I'm one of those 1,000 parrots. <laughs> I'm a farmer that farms in the Sydney Basin. I don't intend on leaving. And I don't think Sydney uh, wants to have tarmac and tiles from the coast to the mountains. The environment would be devastated. My question is to each of you in turn, and firstly, Ian Sinclair, transferable development rights as a way of not only protecting the existing commercial farms, but a way of providing incentive for new farmers and new entrants so as, so as that 1,000 can become 2,000, can become 6,000. Fiona Simpson and the others, um, as an endangered species, right to farm legislation is the only way of protecting that species. What is New South Wales farmers doing about putting the right to farm legislation on the statute so that we don't have pictures like we saw Ian put up where a new entrant has complained about an existing farm that's been there for 100 years or so and getting the support of government through the EPA and other legislations. We have no legislation to protect the farmers. So those questions I'd like to get some answers, please. Thank you. OK, uh, I'll go Ian and then... Yeah. I'll answer Fiona. both of them because I've got a view on both. Um, TDR stands for Transfer of Development Rights. We don't have development rights in Australia. A more appropriate mechanism, a name for it, and we, we really do need to work out the catchy titles here. It's a market-based mechanism. That's all it is. It's a market-based mechanism. We have a thing called biobanking. Everyone heard of biobanking? It's a way that we, we, we can transfer the development potential of land from one area to another. We can preserve biodiversity and whilst, whilst making sure that we make, we make better biodiversity in another place. That's called biobanking. So Ed knows, and I'm pe sure people around the room know that I'm an advocate of this. I found out about it first in 1994 on my first trip to America, and I've been advocating for it ever since. I think we've been calling it the wrong word. I'd like to challenge, it, challenge us to come up with a new word. I'd like to call it food banking because that's what we're doing, is we're banking on food. So that's that issue. Um, I'm happy to explain TDRs if you want me to. Um, the right to farm legislation, right to farm issue, in Wallandilly back in 1991, when I first moved there, we had issues with gas gear guns. And the, the legislation, the noise legislation at the time, gave the council the ability to tell the farmers to stop the gas gear guns because the people, the, the residents were complaining about it. We took the, the council took the attitude, we're going to be reasonable. We would say to the complainants, there's a farm, it's a market, it's a, it's a vineyard, uh, sorry, an orchard next door. Do you like eating the cherries? Do you like eating the apples? Oh yeah, we like that. Well, they're growing it. So we're going to be reasonable. We're not going to act on that complaint. Unfortunately, not every other council in Western Sydney and not every other council in the country takes that attitude. And if a council took that attitude now, I'm sure I would be, if I was at the council then, I would be up before T, uh, T what, what is it called? The, a current affair would be saying, you know, um, we're being corrupt, we're, 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 we're favouring the farmers. So okay. I've got the wind up. Thank you. Fiona, do you, have you got anything to add to that one? Yeah, look, I will. I'll add, um, I'll add a bit in terms of particularly about the right to farm. And I have to say, in my, in my first... I'm a bit like the government. I've been in for about 100 days. <laughs> so in, in my first 100 days, I've certainly had farming and food security very much on the, on the focus. So, Ed, whilst not specifically pursuing the right to farm, in what we are pursuing, which is in terms of this, the upfront planning process and the upfront protection and identification of agricultural lands and water, secu and water um, resources... Those, those, that very right to farm will actually be enshrined in the planning legislation because you will not be able to develop that land for either urban development or 
uh, mining or coal seam gas. So what we are proposing to the government in, the, in their process is that they must, which they don't do now, currently uh, uh, neither with urban development nor with coal seam gas or mining, is there a requirement for any assessment of the land or its biophysical features or its water or its soil or its current land use. And so what we're suggesting to the government and suggesting strongly is that these factors are actually taken into account prior to any sorts of development licences being awarded over land. We would like to see biobanking available to farmers. It's certainly available to other industries such as the mining industry and we are lobbying for that. The other thing we are lobbying for in terms of again the right to farm sort of legislation is that uh, particularly over on the coastal areas many of our members have been affected by, by councils who have turned their rural zones into environmental zones. Now, whilst I'm all, I'm all for environmental zones as well, what it has meant is that, they are, that a lot of the people who have that land are, are, are now unable to actually carry on their agricultural enterprise, and their agricultural enterprise is not protected. So we are actually uh, talking now about agricultural zoning as opposed to rural zoning. And look, at its very early stages, it's, it's an infancy sort of idea, it's a hatchling. Um, but certainly, you know, I think we have a number of, we are, have a number of irons in the fire in terms of ensuring that our farmers, whether they're on the city fringe or wherever they are, are still able to farm and produce food. Hi, my name's Claire. Um, I, I guess I'm sceptical of um, governments and how much, you know, the extent to which they, 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 they will act to defend the interests of farmers and food eaters, um, and certainly sceptical of big corporates. And one of the things that I'm most excited about, and we've got, seen an example of it tonight in that Food Connect provided some of our um, food this evening, uh, one of the things I'm most excited about is building relationships between farmers and uh, food eaters. Um, Partly because that gives an opportunity for farmers to get a better, um, to get you know a better rate of pay for what they're for what they're doing, but also because I think it um, has the potential to create relationships and to um, create some of that um, visceral connection with the food that Phil was talking about, um, which I think perhaps gives more potentially um, will create more political will um, to defend to defend farmers in the long run. <laughs> There's not really a question. Yeah, no, I just enjoy Take it as a comment. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure there's an answer. The answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. From, yeah, from no. a political or, or perhaps the answer is 42. We're not asking the right question. Yeah, from, yeah. from a political point of view, I think one of the great challenges is actually making people realise the importance of food security and the fact that we do have farmers in Western Sydney. When I told some of my colleagues today, who are reasonably educated people, what I was doing, they were amazed at the volume of produce actually from Western Sydney and that there are people whose livelihoods depend upon it. And I think until we get that message out that Western Sydney is important and that moving onto those agricultural lands is going to threaten our wellbeing, you're not going to get the political will. So I think one of the first stages has to be actually raising that awareness and making sure that we do have something that does allow our farmers to have that right to farm. I have to just come in here too because I think Costa, at the very beginning you were talking about and I think one of the first statements you made was wouldn't it be great if there was an office for food? Well there is, you know. There's actually an office for food security and agricultural sustainability just being created in the new government, in our, local, in our new state government. There's an office of food security and agricultural sustainability. What does it do? Hmm. Can anyone tell me? They look after the, the defence of the nation, security. <laughs> we, are, we are lobbying very hard along the lines that Ed Beale suggested to make sure that it has a really good role in actually um, playing a role in, in protecting the food eaters and the food producers. Can I just add something also? Perhaps we're using the wrong term as security. Perhaps the better term is keeping it local. Mm. Because if we say keeping it local, that works on a national level. We, we keep the food within our, bound, within our borders. A state level, we, we, we celebrate the variety of food that's grown in the state and the different landscapes that it's grown in. And you can bring it down to the Sydney level, which says let's grow food locally on the edge of Sydney. Question down here in the front. Uh, Charles is my name. 
Uh, Phil, thanks very much for your nostalgia trip there. Um, Italy and lots of Europe, uh, it's really made up of many cities, but medium-sized cities, not huge cities. And a question here tonight for me is, everybody seems to presume that Sydney is going to keep growing and we're not offering an alternative because that we've got to cater for more population, how we're going to cater for that population in Australia is the question. And if we presume that Sydney is going to keep growing, we're still going to have our problems about fighting over land here, there and everywhere. For example, if we decide to put in a fast train down to Canberra, get our airport away from the city, uh, or alternative airport, put a big city down near Barrel, you know, right next to some of the wealthy properties down there. I, I wouldn't like that. I live in Barrow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, you start off with a new style of infrastructure which doesn't depend on a whole lot of transport needs. Uh, you can build in your local produced food and distribu distributed food, etc. But anybody like to address this question about other new, smaller cities? Just yeah. a quick, I was only going to say a quick comment. Quick comment is that what that takes is upfront planning. And that's something that we don't have now in this state. We do not have good upfront planning prior to development. We have ad hoc proponent driven planning. Alison? Well, 70% of population growth comes from the combined effects of an ageing population and new babies. About 30% is immigration. So there's a key challenge in actually encouraging existing residents to move. And one of the things that has come out in a lot of West Rocks community consultations has been that people love Western Sydney. They don't want to leave Western Sydney. And I agree, it's a fantastic place to live. Why would you want to live anywhere else? So we're accepting that we'll probably have a million extra people and we're trying to ensure that that's planned for. There have been regional cities programs to try to encourage people to move to places like Dubbo. As far as I can see, and I spend a lot of time in Dubbo, it mm -hmm. hasn't dramatically increased the population of Dubbo or other centres like that. So I'm sceptical as to whether that can actually be achieved, but I think it's a good idea, but whether it can happen. Phil, do you want to add? Yeah, look, I mean, decentralisation has been this great yearning in Australia for a long time. And try as we may, people love living by the coast and they love living in big cities. You know, our young people's migration stream in Australia is to the big cities. The, the only significant decentralisation move in the last decade or more is the one that Ian is concerned about, is the movement to the regional cities and large towns on the coast and that sort of recreational land use living is actually counter to farming, not a solution to farming. High speed trains all around the world suck people into big cities. In Bologna, you have the delight of going to Milan. People from Milan don't go to Bologna. The Midlands in England are concerned that the new high speed rail system will just mean the Midland cities get bypassed and people go to London. Can I, can I just say one thing but, that Fiona said? I think we've got to stop saying that our planning system is no good. You know, I think Sydney and New South Wales planning documents are world class. What we do need, however, is that those planning documents maintain their integrity in the face of attack by organisations, property developers and other mean-spirited, selfish advocates for quick and easy gain from property development, rather than the proper planned rollout of affordable housing. And what we need is politicians to commit themselves to those plans, not fall over every time they're lobbied by the UDIA and other property development groups. And there's a big difference between that and not having good plans. Can I just back up? Can I say something? Um, this is the Metropolitan Plan. I'm a planner, so of course I'm going to be advocates for now my you're profession. Now you're all planners. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Action F 2.1, consider the development of an agriculture policy for Sydney. Action 2.2, undertake mapping to inform the future strategic policy making with respect to agricultural activities and resource lands. That's what I was saying before. We need, as Phil was saying, we've got some pretty good documents. We just need the intestinal fortitude to back it up and don't listen to the developer lobby. That's it. So, so that, 
So the big question then is... Perhaps that we should move up. I should go and sit next to you. Well, <laughs> so if it's so good, why is it so bad? Hey? If it's so good, why is the system so bad? Why is because it, why is it that, that we're disregarding these great plans? Why Is it, is it not that the, that the grand plan, the grand plan for coal and coal seam gas development and urban development absolutely wrecks all these other good layers of planning? Exactly. I agree. State? I agree. That, that, so that isn't we that have... a planning fault, though? The no, it's not, a, it's not a fault of planning. It's a fault of implementing the plan. That's the difference. We have planning and we have good planners. Oh, look, that's what look we don't. everyone's a planner because everybody understands, everybody has an opinion as to what Phil and I do. But, and I'm going to be a bit, con, con, um, probably a bit controversial here, we are a bit, we try, we try to be objective. We try to look at both sides of the coin. We try to understand what the issues are and then come up with a policy document. However, planners don't make decisions, it's the politicians that make the decisions. You need, to, you need the politicians to understand and to keep, keep on the good fight of food. There isn't a politician in New South Wales that I know of that stands up, both either side of, of, the, of the government, that has stood up and said, let's, let's look at what's happening with the food in Sydney or New South Wales. That's what we need to do. Uh, there's a good follow-on question. How? How? Oh, yeah. sorry. Um, well, I suppose it all starts with, um, with getting people to not be apathetic about it. Getting people to understand... Look, we're all the converted here, aren't we? Is there anyone here that disagrees with what I've been saying? I don't think there is. <laughs> if there is, I'm happy to talk to you about it. Um, but, look, I think, I think what we, the how to do it is we need to, we need to engage with people. We need to talk to people. We need to make people aware. As, as Alison was saying, nobody believes me when I say we grow food in Western Sydney. Nobody believes me. I've been driving through Western Sydney for the past 15 years, looking through Leppington and the Richmond Lowlands and all that sort of thing. It absolutely astounds me how the food is still grown there. It's still being grown there, but nobody understands it. We've got Hawkesbury Harvest, and there's a few people, but we need to get an advocate for it. I don't know who that advocate is, but we need to be an, get an advocate for it that can take all the information that we have and get out there and do something about it. We need to actually make the connection again, as I said, between the people, yeah. you know, people eating food and growing food. In, in the yeah. old days, and we heard Phil's story, you know, in the old days everybody had grannies and grandpas and aunties yeah. and uncles that lived on farms. Farm. You used to go out to the farm and you used to visit them and you used to see the cows getting milked and you used to, to, to smell the grass and the grain and you used to do that. One of the things that we're pushing in the association is to actually try and mandate, you'd be aware that the curriculum is getting reviewed currently, the national curriculum. So we're actually trying to mandate that food production, and that would be a great thing for you to support anyone here who's passionate about that, is actually introduced at every level of schooling. So from kindy right through to year 12, there is a level, there is a certain um, subject of food production that is actually within the curriculum, so that kids now will understand as they're coming through about food production. Hi, Michael Champion, Organic Farmer at Bangrove Mountain. And I'm glad to hear, Fiona, that you're looking at uh, agricultural areas because that's something that we're working on in that area because we don't have the sort of urban influx yet but we're trying to make sure that that area doesn't get that. Um, I, I refer back to some, and Ian Sinclair and some of you others might have heard of a Professor John Whiteleg who talks about with all this change, the social change is, is way ahead of the political effort. In other words, what people want as a society, it takes the politicians another 10 years to actually get to it. Isn't part of the problem, it isn't where the advocacy should be, is focused on the people. If you're going to have another million people in Penrith, haven't you got to convince them that they've got to go into houses that go up rather than houses that go out? For generation upon generation, every influx of people in the, into a Sydney has wanted land and wanted their quarter, quarter acre or, or something like that. My family, the same. My grandfather taught me to grow vegetables on three acres at Epping. You can't get three acres in Epping anymore. Um, so that's, that's the question. Um, shouldn't we be a social, be, being social advocates as well? And you look at what, what Philip talked about in terms of the the, the, the ongoing uh, vegetable farms, the Italians, the Maltese, the Vietnamese, the Chinese, the Lebanese, and now the Africans. And what are they doing? They grow vegetables because that's what they can do. As you said, their primary asset is the land they are on. 
once they have educated their kids and made their kids into doctors, lawyers and whoever, they leave the land and there's no progression and there's none of that con continuity that you were talking about in Bologna or parts of Italy or France or anywhere like that. We haven't got that. We don't, we value our land more than we value the food. And we've got to change people's ideas about that. And that's social advocacy as much as political advocacy. Thank you. Uh, if uh, these two gentlemen are uh, farmer 1000 and farmer 999, then I'm farmer 998. I'm an apple orchardist <laughs> from, uh, from Bilpin. Um, one of the things that I notice when I drive around the Sydney Basin is this enormous amount of underutilised agricultural land uh, that has enormous agricultural potential. Now, some of that is in areas that aren't going to be developed uh, in the foreseeable future, but people have bought them on a speculative basis. You know, I know, you know, in the Hawkesbury, you know, there are individuals there that own six or seven quite large properties on the basis that maybe someday they're going to be able to subdivide them. What I'm suggesting is that this, this land um, should be allowed to be leased on a on, on reasonable term basis for agriculture and the landowners be given some concessions for um, that right to farm, whether it's through tax or whether it's through rates or whether it's through whatever, provided that, you know, um, and, and there are plenty of leasing arrangements that can be seen elsewhere in the world where the land's protected, you know, environmentally and, and whatever, um, and most good farmers are doing that anyway. The other, the other so, so I'll, I'll leave that um, for you guys to answer, but the other point that I'll make, uh, Fiona, following on your comments about re-educating um, um, people about farming, I was involved in the FarmLink program in the 1970s um, when, when we had open days and invited people from urban um, Australia to come out and visit. It was done through the National Farmers Federation. In the year of the farmer, New South Wales farmers should be looking at a similar program uh, and I've been sort of pushing that concept for some while. Yeah, we do have a um, farm day, and that's actually been... I think it's been around for some years. Now, it hasn't been taken up in a huge amount. It's getting a little bit more of momentum. I think it's probably been going for three or four years at least. And it's a day in May. It's actually a weekend in May where uh, you can register. There's a, a website you can go on to, and you, re and you and, uh, farmers volunteer and city people volunteer, and they go and um, you go and stay with a farmer for the weekend. And you can take your family, you can, you're meant to do what they do, and, um, and that's the same sort of idea as, as that. So I think we do need to, um, to connect. We do need to look really pro proactively and, and outside the square about ways to connect. And, um, I, I, you know, the farmers' markets, I can't remember who it was talking. Phil, I think, was talking about them. That's sort of sort of a way, but not really. It doesn't give you the connection of it growing in the soil and and you know actually seeing the produce. So, um, and then look, I'm very interested to explore something like the the the, the buyer banking. And I think um, Ian said food banking perhaps would be a better term for it. I actually think we were talking earlier maybe farm banking even might better. even be a better term. Um, and you know, I think that that Didn't is. Did we used to have the rural bank? <laughs> I think do I, do I recall, I'm a bit older than that, but I think I recall that. Theoretically, I have to tell you, under the government's new strategic regional land use policy, if we can get it right and we can identify um, water and soils that should be protected, they should be protected. But it would be good for the farmers who have that to be able to benefit, um, you know, in some form of a, a tradable development right, such as a farm bank or something like that. I reckon it's a great idea. I've been ad trying to advocate that for a while yep. as, an, as, an, as a way of doing it. There is a lot. You, have a, you go out to Richmond Lowlands, there's a hell of a lot of land there that's just lying vacant. I see it every time I take students out there. And I've been saying, why can't we do that? You can actually, and actually, this is the office of the Hawkesbury Nepea and all the old Hawkesbury Nepea Catchment Management Trust or the CMA or whoever wants to be involved. They can actually come in and help them make it best practice in soil and water management. And wouldn't that be fantastic? There you go. The problem we have, as I said, is people don't realise how much agriculture is here. We actually had Tony Burke come down to the Israel Farmers Association when he first became uh, Minister for Agriculture. And he's, what he said, he said, actually, he said, uh, the, only thing I, the only agriculture in my area is the grass strips on the side of the road. <laughs> He's lecturer at Rockdale. He flies out every morning over the Chinese Heritage Listed Gardens. In, uh, the airport. Yeah? 
the Minister for Agriculture. on his way there. That's right, yeah. Anyway, the <laughs> question I'm coming to you, Alison, is we don't, as you were saying, we don't appreciate the air, the fresh environment, we don't appreciate food. See that bottle over there? Bottle of drinking water? That probably costs the equivalent of three kilolitres of water. Yes. Yet people are prepared to pay $3 for a little bottle like that. The fresh food, the price of, of bananas here a while back was $13 a kilo. People, we can't afford to buy them. Yet they pay $35 a kilo for a Mars bar. This is what we need. We, I went and bought a whole box of Valencia oranges for $6. <laughs> Food's too cheap, we just do not appreciate it. Now that's my question to you. How do we, or, and you'll see what you found, how do we get people to realise the value of the product they're buying? Mm. I think it really is about educating people and it is about educating around the cost but also the cost of not eating those foods and the cost, I mean we've seen very successful campaigns around tobacco and around alcohol that we're now going to have to have the same sort of campaigns around obesity and the way that you fight obesity is to eat better food yeah. and I absolutely think that's the trick and you're right that um, it is $35 a kilo for Mars bar but you wouldn't eat a kilo of Mars bars, whereas I reckon I could eat a kilo of grapes. So <laughs> it, 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 I think education is the way forward, and we really do need to wear that, raise that awareness. Mm. I would. Yeah. Well, I, I would too. <laughs> I do. Well, as a, as a uh, community farmer, as a backyard farmer, and as a school farmer, I believe some of our uh, richest unused agricultural land are our nature strips and our verges. Mm. And if we utilise those, we would feed all the fresh sunlight that we should be eating each week. We could pick it on our way home off the street. And I'm working on it, believe me. Thanks, Gossip. I'm Jim Halson from uh, Benelong Holdings. Um, I've been in the uh, fresh produce markets in Sydney for 25 years. And I used to come out and visit 60 growers just in the basin. And I would buy broccoli from them for $25 a case, for an eight kilo case. Today I can still buy broccoli for $25 a case. I mean, that's crazy. Mm. You know, the price of everything else has gone up. Okay. And I talked to some of the growers. Down, down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who's pushing it down? Yeah. And then, then I, the other sort of, I, I look at other things. You know, the cost of bringing a head of lettuce down from Gatton to Sydney is 50 cents a head now. It's just crazy. We can grow it in the basin. So we've just got to start doing it. And I come, out, I come out west quite often and I say, what are we doing feeding these mobile pet food units? You know, they're just mm. wandering around on the grass, eating the grass. We should be putting food in there instead. People laugh at me, you know. But I used to come and visit growers that were, you know, really passionate about growing on that land. And now all it's, it's got horse adjustment on it. It's just ridiculous. Mm. And, and, you know, you talk about growers' markets. Growers... You know, I, I talk to out here, they make more on a Saturday morning at a, at a grower's market than they do four days a week or five days a week at Flemington Markets. You know, it just, it just shows you, you've got to sell to the public, direct to the public. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. Okay. I have, I have to just comment quickly, Costa, on that one because, I mean, look, the farm gate pricing um, and the price that consumers are paying, some of you might have seen we've been a little bit active in the press about it lately. And uh, to us it's a real problem because what it means is, is that if farmers are getting the same price for their produce as they got 20 years ago, uh, then you just actually can't keep producing. And that's one of the biggest problems. You know, in, in some of the media that we've done recently, I can tell you now, we, we grow a variety. We grow a summer crop on our property. We're, because we're in the, in the Liverpool Plains, we can grow winter crops and summer crops, which is quite unusual for farmers. You usually either grow one or the other, and we can grow both. And we grow this crop called sorghum, which, mm -hmm. is, a, which is a stock food predominantly. And we've been growing this particular variety for 21 years, and it's having its 21st birthday. And so my husband got his little book out and looked up the figures for the seed company with its 20... And, you know, 21 years ago, we got more money per tonne than we get for it now. Yet you could imagine the price of our machinery has doubled and tripled. The price of our inputs have doubled and tripled. The price of everything else has doubled and tripled. The price of our fuel has doubled and tripled. Yet the price we're getting for our produce. Our pumpkin growers are getting 30 cents a kilo. Our chicken producers are getting 50 cents a chicken. 
You know, 50 cents a chicken. How much are you paying for chicken meat? You know, this is the sort of thing. I don't know what the answer is, but it's a major problem. Well, when we start to disengage from the current food system and support alternative food systems, uh, we, can, we can start to pay the farmers what they deserve. And actually, speaking of our farmers, could we put our hands together for our farmers who are in the crowd? <laughs> We, we need to shake their hands more often. So. I was talking to a friend of mine and, uh, and we were discussing a mutual acquaintance and I said, uh, oh, how are they going? And uh, he talking about the mutual friend and a mutual acquaintance and his partner. He said, oh, well, I ran into uh, Peter at uh, St Vinnie's and she was in a hurry to go to McDonald's and get the uh, $1 specials uh, while they were on so she could take them home and put them in the freezer. So she goes to three or four McDonald's a day and collects these one dollar specials oh, and puts them in the freezer. Oh god. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Um, final final question before our wrap. Thanks. Uh, my name is Salman. I live in Minchinbury in a seven hundred square meter plot. Um, got one wife, four kids, and one inherited mother in law. <laughs> <laughs> Just um, that gentleman always said, how do we appreciate food? Um, I was not asking any question, but I just want to inform that I am actually doing home farming, uh, courtesy to gentlemen like um, Costa and other people I, I met. I grow um, tomatoes, vegetables, all sorts and fruits, and I have chicken. I've never, we never buy eggs at all for the last few years. I do a little bit of home coil farming, and then I've got fish as well, which for the table. So. What I was trying to say is that we should also appreciate food by growing ourselves. And I know that I have to wake up early in the morning and spend around half an hour every day to grow my crops. So anybody is welcome to come and have a look. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'd just like to close by giving you each one sentence um, uh, just I'd to just... close with a final thought really like to acknowledge the contribution that our local farmers do make. As the person who manages to kill absolutely everything, I won't be one of those people who is growing food in my backyard. So thanks to people like you, we can ensure that we do have a food supply. And I think on the political side, particularly at the council level, it's important that we do everything we can to support our local farmers. Yeah, look, um, I think that for me it's just about thinking about food and it's about thinking about food production land and water and um, preserving and protecting that land and that water for the future generations because uh, if it's all gone now, if it's all covered by houses or all covered by mines or all covered by energy supplies, what on earth are we going to eat? So that's my sentence. I, I'd just like us to make sure that we always look along the food supply chain. Um, we're doing some work at the moment for Sydney Markets Limited with Woolworths and Coles holding, what, two-thirds of the food supply chain, with Metcash now gobbling up IGA and David's Holdings to become the third major player, the Sydney Markets Limited that is the place that people can sell their produce and other people can go and buy that produce either to eat or to process, that that is an institution that will go the same way as Sydney's farmlands unless consumers wake up and start choosing their food wisely. Um, we can coin a new concept and call a new phrase again and call it Sydney Urban Agriculture, which talks about community gardens, school gardens, backyard gardens, verges, verge gardens, um, home farming and commercial farming on the fringe. And I think we need all of it, not one or the other of it. I think it needs to have everything. Ladies and gentlemen, can you put your hands together for our speakers?